Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you that you've joined us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series of lessons is entitled, The Least of These, Ministering to Those in Need. And we're coming up to the end, and we're drawing some conclusions about all that. This is lesson number 11, entitled, <coughs> Living the Advent Hope. It's the lesson for September 14 of 2019. As usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. We'll ask you to pray with us. Our kind and wonderful Father, it is always a privilege to come together with friends and talk about you. May we come to know you better. May we figure out ways to meet the challenges that are being presented to us in these lessons is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So, there shouldn't be any question in the minds of anybody at this table about the fact that we are approaching the end of this world's history. Uh, how much time are we spending in preparation for that second coming? Well, the book of Matthew, in particular, speaks of the kingdom of heaven involving not only things which happen here on this earth and the here and now, but also what will happen in the future glorious kingdom of God in heaven and later back on this earth. There's some interesting passages about that we need to compare. Dennis? Matthew 10, uh, 5 to 8. These 12 men were sent out by Jesus with the following instructions. Do not go to any Gentile territory or any Samaritan towns. Instead, you are to go to the lost sheep of the house of the people of Israel. Go and preach. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick. Bring the dead back to life. Heal those who suffer from dreaded skin disease and drive out demons. You have received without paying, so give without being paid. American Bible Society, Good News Translation. Okay, I. several of us here are in the health professions. How would you feel if you suddenly joined a, a young pastor and he said, I have power from heaven I would like to give you. Uh, go out and heal the sick, raise the dead, bring the, you know, <laughs> heal the lepers, etc. And you would say, uh, are you sure? <laughs> would that include strokes? And heart disease, I hope so. Heart disease? I hope so. I wonder what the 12 men thought about it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and this was the, this was their very first time to go out to the city, the towns of Galilee. I mean, for some of them, they had just joined Jesus' group probably a couple of months before that. And he says, well, go on, go ahead, do it. Are there any records of them raising the dead? Well, that's a problem, not till after the resurrection of Jesus. But they apparently were successful because in other, I don't know if it's in this passage or in other ones, when they come back, they're rejoicing that the demons are subject to them. Yep. Exactly. So, that's pretty awesome stuff. Well, what did he mean when he said the kingdom of heaven is near? Heal the sick, bring the dead back to life, heal those who suffer from dreaded skin diseases, and drive out demons. What did that mean? Now, some people have referred to the kingdom of God on this earth as the kingdom of grace. Does healing the sick, bring the dead back to life, and even driving out demons mean a kingdom of grace is here? How do you understand that passage? Well, Ellen White in The Great Controversy uh, 347 says, as used in the Bible, the kingdom, the expression kingdom of God is employed to designate both the kingdom of grace and the kingdom of glory. Mm -hmm. The kingdom of grace is brought to view by Paul in the epistle to the Hebrews after pointing to Christ, the compassionate intercessor uh, who is touched with the feeling of our infirmities, the apostle says, says let us therefore bold, come boldly in unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16. The throne of grace represents the kingdom of grace, for the existence of a throne implies the existence of a kingdom. Yeah. In many of his parables, Jesus w uses the expression, the kingdom of heaven, to designate the work of divine grace upon the hearts, as you 
yeah. implied there. So the throne of glory represents the kingdom of glory, and that kingdom is referred to in the Savior's words, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he shall sit on the throne of his glory, and he shall be uh, gathered, and before him uh, shall be gathered all nations. This kingdom is yet future. It is not to be set up until the second advent of Christ. So that kind of gives the, yeah. uh, there's, well, there's more to the past. And yet, and yet, Jesus said, this is John eighteen thirty six. My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom belonged to this world, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish authorities. No, my kingdom does not belong here. Right. It's part of his his presence actually brought the kingdom of grace mm -hmm. uh, to us. So it had come near or was amongst us, and and we have the potential because the kingdom is within us, not out there mm -hmm. somewhere. Yeah, see, I've always thought that he said the kingdom of heaven is here. He's there. That's the kingdom of heaven, them being near him. Okay. We can look well. at that like now, too. The kingdom of heaven is here if we represent that kingdom in our interaction with other people but, and, and, around us. And I, I recognize that that for those who have start going into very little deeper into theology, that poses a bit of a problem because we believe God is omnipresent. So that means the kingdom of heaven is always here, everywhere. Is that, are we going to take it to that extent? Or then there's no reason to say the kingdom of heaven is here. He's well, here. further on in the passage, it says the, the kingdom of grace was promised, but it wasn't actually set up until Christ's sacrifice was made. Then, so it had come near at that point. It had yeah. come amongst them by promise, but it wasn't actually established until the death of Christ. Our challenge, of course, is to do what God asks us to do, preparing here on this earth for the kingdom which will be there. And God has given us some very specific instructions. Well, from the day of Adam and Eve, when they sinned and were expelled from the garden, the human race has hoped for a better day. Some have been in slavery, exile, oppression, poverty, or innumerable other injustices and tragedies. And since we believe that God has the power to intervene, the cry has been, how long, Lord, before you do something? Is God the one that's holding things off? Delaying the coming? Well, try to imagine what kinds of prayers were offered by the slaves in Egypt, for example or the Israelite exiles in Babylon, or you know, a whole no host of other situations where people have been martyred or whatever for their beliefs. Well, there's Isn't a sense in which God does, because Jesus said in Acts, um, it's not for you to know the times which uh, God has fixed in his authority. So, mm -hmm. and... Uh, and it would be much later before Jesus would come the second time. Um, and only the Father knows when that's going to be, he says. So so there's a certain sense in which that, but it may have more to do with uh, everything being ready. In other words, mm -hmm. he's the one that decides when things are ready, uh, as opposed to, well, on this date, yeah. you know, whatever happens. I think of the Middle Ages. Think of the prayers of the yeah. faithful during the Middle Ages. I mean, this is a long, long time. That's right. Did they think those prayers were doing any good? Well, and we have suggested some might be tempted to believe that our prayers never reach God's throne. But even the blood of the martyrs was and is crying out, and that cry was and is being heard in the throne room of heaven. What evidence do we have for that, Myra? Revelation 5, 9 and 10. Then the Lamb broke open the fifth seal. I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been killed because they had proclaimed God's word and had been faithful in their witnessing. They shouted in a loud voice, Almighty God, holy and true, how long will it be until you judge the people on earth and punish them for killing us? I should make a comment here. My... Good News Bible has let me down a little bit here in this particular passage. It talks about souls, but in actual fact, it's talking about the blood. 
just as the blood of Abel was crying out from the ground, uh, it's the blood that cries from underneath the altar. If you take it as souls, it doesn't quite fit our picture of yeah. Shepherd, does it? Right. No. Right. I mean, it could easily be misinterpreted if that were the case. Well, it may be impossible for us to fully understand why at this point in history God tells us that those trials are the best preparation we can have for what is coming. Does it make sense to you to hear that the time of trouble ahead of us is the best preparation for a time when there will be no troubles? How can that be? It's not clear how that makes sense. <laughs> Well, I re ran across a statement from Ellen White recently, and I guess I should have probably put it in here, that helped a little bit. It makes sense to me. And part of the reason God allows these terrible things to happen at the end is because Satan has always claimed that he could run a better world, a better universe than God does. And so God has to say, okay, to be fair to everybody, we have to have at least a short time when Satan is almost completely in control. And this will be a, a, a final clarification to the entire universe what, would it, what things would be like if Satan were allowed to persist and, and do his thing. So in that sense, I guess it's, it's necessary. Well, nothing we do is in, uh, for good is in our own strength. So trials deepen our relationship with God. And that prepares us mm -hmm. for even deeper experiences. Here's what's incredible in our next paragraph in our handout. By the way, our handouts, if you're interested, are, are, can be found on our website at theox.org. That's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. And you can see most of the materials and so forth that we use here. Well, it turns out that Satan firmly believes, believe it or not, it's hard for us to believe it. He firmly believes that given complete freedom, everyone would choose to be as selfish as he is. But God says that is not true. There have been and there will be in the future a significant group of people who will live loving lives because that is the best way to live. Satan denies that and does not believe that it will ever be possible. So as a last step in the war we call the Great Controversy, God will allow Satan to have near complete control of things on this earth so the entire universe can see what it would be like to have Satan in control. I don't know if that helps any or maybe a little bit. I shudder to think of that. Yeah. 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 Shudder? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Jim, I think you have a comment on that. I do, actually. Yeah. Zechariah right. one twelve. Lord. Yes. Then the angel said, Almighty Lord... You have been angry with Jerusalem and the cities of Judah for 70 years now. How much longer will it be before you show them mercy? Okay. If you remember the story of Zechariah and, and Haggai, they were two Old Testament prophets, one quite elderly and one quite young, who were struggling to get the, the children of Israel, who had the, one, the few, the relatively few children of Israel who had come back to Jerusalem, back to Judea, I should say, probably, um, from Babylon after being in exile and he, they're struggling to get those people to come together and rebuild the temple. Um, when, they, when that foundation was laid some of the senior citizens wept because they said this is nothing like Solomon's temple. And so Zechariah did what? He cried out, Lord, how much longer will it be before you show them mercy? Well, even in the successful days of David, while expanding his kingdom and writing the Psalms, there were many of them bemoaning with laments about the apparent prosperity and good fortune of the wicked, while the righteous are abused, exploited, and poor. What is behind those laments? Psalms 94, 3-7 to seven. How much longer will the wicked be glad? How much longer, Lord? How much longer will crim criminals be proud? and boast about their crimes. They crush your people, Lord. They oppose those who belong to you. They kill widows and orphans and murder the strangers who live in our land. They say the Lord does not see us. The God of Israel does not notice. Hmm. People who do not believe in the omnipotence of God 
or maybe even the existence of God, may feel that injustice, poverty, and trouble are just a natural part of living on this earth. But for people who believe in an almighty God who could prevent such problems, there is a tendency to repeat the words of Habakkuk. Uh, Habakkuk 1, verse 2. O Lord, how long must I call for help before you listen, before you save us from violence? Well, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul recognized that all creation was groaning with pain, like the pains of childbirth because of the evil in our world. But God has not forgotten, and he is not ignoring the problem. Okay, this is from Romans eight nineteen to 22. All of creation waits with eager longing for God to reveal his children. For creation was condemned to lose its purpose, not of its own will, but because God willed it to be so. Yet there was hope. There was the hope that creation itself would one day be set free from its slavery to decay and would share the glorious freedom of the children of God. For we know that up to the present time, all of creation groans with pain, like the pain of childbirth. Wow. Well, even Jesus is recorded in Luke 18, 1 to 8. And maybe I'll just take a moment to read that. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to teach them that they should always pray and never become discouraged. In a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected people. And there was a widow in that same town who kept coming to him and pleading for her rights, saying, Help me against my opponent. For a long time, the judge refused to act. But at last he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or respect people, yet because of all the trouble this widow is giving me, I will see to it that she gets her rights. If I don't, she will keep on coming and finally wear me out. And the Lord said, That's just the way I behave, right? (laughs) No. Listen to what that corrupt judge said. Now will God not judge in favor of his own people who cried him day and night for help? Will he be slow to help them? I tell you, he will judge in their favor and do it quickly. Will the Son of Man find faith on earth when he comes? Wow. Sometimes Christians lay themselves open to being accused of being, quote, so otherworldly minded that they are of no earthly good. You've probably heard that expression once or Mm -hmm. twice before. While Christians who firmly believe in the promises of Scripture and the second coming should find those promises a ray of hope, that does not mean that they are free to sit back and relax and do nothing here and now. Someone that all many of us here know very well, Graham Maxwell, used to say, there are some Adventists who feel like they were born on the bus and the bus is headed for the kingdom and all you got to do is sit back and enjoy the ride. <laughs> well, sometimes powerful people have told the poor just to accept their sad conditions because Jesus will come back soon and make it right. Well, one of the main parts of... You, if you are... If you are born on the bus, should you get off the bus? Well, that's a good question. It's probably appropriate to get off of the bus in imagination and think about how it would be if you were out there. And then hopefully you'll get back on and be very happy to be there and very very happy to help in whatever you can anytime there's a problem. If there's a flat tire, go out and help. Yes, tire. absolutely. Well, a major part of this lesson is Matthew 24 and 25. When I say Matthew 24 and 25, what pops into your mind? Jesus' discourse about the destruction of Jerusalem and the the future, what's going to happen, which he mingles with AD 70 and the end time. Okay. So those of us who call ourselves Adventists, tend to focus on Matthew 24 a little bit more than we do on Matthew 25. And in Matthew 24, what are some of the things we, we see there? Now, let's remember, let's, let's just get the full picture here. Jesus and his disciples have been in the temple courtyard, in the temple, this would be Herod's temple, all day long. He has been accused by Pharisees and Sadducees. They've been doing everything they possibly can to try to trip him up and to trap him. And they always came up looking very foolish. He was very successful all day long. And toward the end of that day, he said, you know, I'm telling you, look at this temple, look at this beautiful thing. Not one stone will be left on top of another one. And his disciples must have gone, 
Huh? What are you talking about? And so they left the temple. They traveled out down through the Kidron Valley up on the side of, of uh, Mount of Olives. And before, and by that point, the disciples figured they had gotten far enough away so they could have a little bit of a private conversation with Jesus. Says, "Please now, Lord, tell tell us what, how how could this possibly be? I mean, here's this enormous building, and built with these fant- huge, enormous blocks of marble." that have been fit together perfectly, and you wonder how anyone could even begin to move them. And it didn't seem possible to them. And, of course, Jesus starts off and he gives them this discourse. And, of course, as Dennis has already pointed out, he mixes up some of the events connected with the destruction of Jerusalem with later events which will be connected to the second coming. Why do you suppose he did that? I'm sure he did not do it to confuse them, but they were confused. (laughs) Okay. And some of our friends have been confused by it also. Yes. Well, Jesus warned them of some serious things that were going to happen, didn't he? Mm -hmm. What did he say? False Christ, false prophets, deceiving, if possible, the very elect. Wow. In fact, things would be so bad that if things were not cut short, no one would survive. What do you think he meant by that? Which time period is going to be cut short? The end time. The end time. Very end. (laughs) Okay. Well, Jesus didn't stop there. Remember, there were no chapter and no verse divisions in the Bible in those days, in the Bible for hundreds of years. He just kept right on going. He moved into Matthew 25. And what do we find in Matthew 25? Verse 45, the king will reply. Hold on just a minute. I want you to give your answer (laughs) before you you help us on. The first first parable is about the ten virgins. And what's the basic idea there? Be prepared. Be prepared. And how do you get prepared? Have lots of oil Lots of spare oil, which is the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. They all had oil. Yeah. Some of them didn't have enough. What would that mean in terms of 2019? When we're tested, we need to be able to come out at the other end. We need to... Well, we have faith. You know, Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith in the earth? Mm -hmm. So... Uh, and as he said to Peter, I pray that your faith fail not. Okay. So it's all about developing faith. And and, uh, and how do we do that? Spending time with following Jesus, mm-hmm. trusting. Spending time, uh, spending time with, with the Word, with Jesus. Yep. Yep. Jim, I think you have a <clears throat> comment about that. Those who endeavor to obey all the commandments of God will be opposed and derided. They can stand only in God. In order to endure the trial before them, they must understand the will of God is revealed in His Word. They can honor Him only as they have a right conception of His character, government, and purposes, and act in accordance with them. None but those who have fortified the mind with the truths of the Bible will stand through the last great conflict. To every soul will come the searching test. Shall I obey God rather than men? The decisive hour is now, excuse me, is even now at hand. Are our feet planted in on the rock of God's immutable word? Are we prepared to stand firm in defense of the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus? Okay. Great Controversy 593-94. That's a pretty powerful statement. Uh, I can remember when I was younger, that I had gotten the impression, I don't know if anyone, I think somebody even sort of implied this to me, and that's that we needed to memorize the 28, whatever, however many there were in those days, Bible studies, so that if anyone asked us a question about any Adventist belief, we could say, boom, 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 boom. Here are the passages. Is that what it's talking about here? No, but from that, excuse me, from that first sentence here, those who endeavor to obey the, all the commandments of God, 
will be opposed and derided. That's happening now. Yes. Not not by other religious people, but by the world. I mean, you know. <clears throat> well, and I, I should have quoted this. I should have gotten this quote but on on the internet one day a few weeks ago. There was a thing, a statement that came up that said that there are now people in Congress yeah. saying that anybody who's who's elected to a national position of any kind should have to renounce any religious affiliation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Renouncing some of the religious affiliations would right. be a good thing. <laughs> you didn't have to say that quite so loud. Well, but, <laughs> no, it's, but it's true. But it's true. It's true. And I, you know, I always wonder. I, I try to put myself in these situations. What would our world be like if, take your pick, a Muslim had started the United States or a Buddhist or a Hindu uh, or even worse, an agnostic or an atheist? There would be no constitution. Not the kind we have now, that's for sure. It would be constituted (laughs) in everything negative. We would be, I mean, would we want to be in Iran? Would we want to be a China? Would we want to be a Russia? Well, Jesus goes on to talk next about what? The parable of the talents. This parable clearly suggests that there is no time to bury our talents and to do nothing with them. Everyone needs to be using whatever talent or talents are he has to prepare, to promote, I'm sorry, the kingdom of God. So, what is God saying? We need to be using those talents to spread the gospel, to tell people the truth, right? And how how well are we doing at that? And then, of course, there's that final talk about the final judgment. And what was his conclusion? That's Matthew 25, 31 to 46. And here's his conclusion. The king will reply, I tell you, whenever you refuse to help one of the, these least important ones, you refuse to help me. And then, of course, earlier he said just the, uh, the, the mirror image of that, whatever you did for them, you did for me. Wow. The judgment seems to turn on this particular point. What we have done here in this life to help the poor and needy and uninformed about the future kingdom. So what what should be our role each day? Do we believe the words of Jesus? Well, that's what Jesus came to do, to share the kingdom with poor and blind and naked mm-hmm. uh, individuals, all of us. <coughs> and uh, that was, he said, the will of God. That mm-hmm. God, uh, that he, he do that. He didn't come to do his own will, but the will of the Father. So that should be our purpose also, to do the will of the Father. And we see that in the life of Jesus, mm-hmm. uh, reaching out to those who are in need, uh, in whether physically, and we'll get to that aspect later, but also spiritually. Okay, so let's say you're a mechanic. And you work in a garage. How do you share the gospel while you're working at the garage? Well, you I mean, deal it, fairly oh, with yes. with you. Okay. Instead of I mean, and saying, you could, oh, you need a new this or that when they really don't. Yeah. And, I mean, think of all the other kinds of jobs. Uh, you're an accountant. You're a whatever. I mean, sure, you need to be honest. You need to do your very best. I mean, those things should be obvious. But are those, is that the way you share your talents? Are there any other suggestions? I just think that if we're aware and looking for opportunity, God will send them, especially if you pray, Lord, let me be a right influence today. Mm -hmm. Somebody that I make contact with. I find that prayer answered almost every single day with new people I meet. They bring it up. gives me a chance to put in a word for the kingdom. Wow. Well, I think how we treat them is foundational because if we're trying to cheat them and then we try to te- yeah. we get them to come to church there's going to be a conflict <laughs> there's going to be so. a resist- resistance time with them. Yeah. yeah show interest in their lives just plain being nice this goes a long ways yeah mm-hmm. exactly yeah 
Well, but there's no reason for us now at this point in time to be disappointed and discouraged. Dennis, I think you have something about that in 1 Corinthians 15. Yes, verses 20 to 23. For just as all people die because of their union with Adam, in the same way all will be raised to life because of their union with Christ. But each one will be raised in the right order. Christ, first of all, then at the time of his coming, those who belong to him. So, what Paul is suggesting there is that the resurrection of Jesus Christ in the newness of life, of course, is a Christian's promise that God can do the same thing for us. Consider what Paul wrote, if, in fact, there is or will be no resurrection from the dead. He made a pretty blunt argument about that. Um, Myra? Yes. First Corinthians fifteen twelve to 19. Now, since our message is that Christ has been raised from death, how can some say, can some of you say that the dead will not be raised to life? If that is true, it means that Christ was not raised. And if Christ had not been raised from death, then we would have nothing to preach, and you would have nothing to believe. More than that, we are shown that shown to be lying about God because we said that he was raised from death. But if that is true, that the dead are not raised to life, then he did not raise Christ. If, For if the dead are not raised, neither has Christ been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is a delusion and you, will, you are still lost in your sins. It would also mean that the believers in Christ who have died are lost. If our hope in Christ is good for the life, for this life only and no more, then we deserve more pity than anyone else in all the world. Sounds like a lawyer speaking. Wow, yeah. <laughs> is it really true that living a Christian life here and now is pitiful? I don't think so. Mm -mm. I certainly do not see that at all. I firmly... And I, I just think of different things. I obviously am a physician and I deal with a lot of people and many of them are people who are uh, disabled and, and have also have had all sorts of problems in their lives. I, I deal a lot with a lot of disadvantaged people and they 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 are always coming to me and said I've had people come in and say, Every time we come here you look younger than you did last time. I said, <laughs> Hold on, <laughs> it's not quite possible but you know they they think it's amazing that someone like me can be as healthy and so forth as I am at my age. So, But there is the point that if we preach about Christ being raised from the death and there is no resurrection, yeah. then we're lying. Yeah. yeah. And we say God did this. Yeah. If God can't do that, then right. you know, we're, we're a fraud. Yes, exactly. And that's what we should be pitying someone who believes... Yeah. A lie. Fraud. I firmly believe that anyone who fully understands the gospel would choose to live a Christian life here and now even if there were no future reward. I have a friend of a number of years ago that is dead now that had some very interesting discussions with people who didn't believe in God at all on that very issue and he came out very strongly and said, I'm sorry, but I would not change my Christian way of living no matter, even if there were no future reward. And the other guy was just completely flabbergasted. He thought, you know, anybody, like Satan, he thought anybody who has real freedom would go out and party and drink and, you know, booze and, and, and live the wild life and, you know. I think at one time he says, if, even if there was no pie in the sky, by and by, something to that effect. <laughs> yeah. Well, think about the ch stages of change that took place in the lives, attitudes, and outlooks of the disciples, starting on Resurrection Sunday, and think of what happened just before that, up to Pentecost. Pentecost. And Acts Gordon? 2, verses 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost came, all the believers were gathered together in one place. Suddenly, there was a, was there a noise from the sky which sounded like a strong wind blowing, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then they saw what looked like tongues of fire which spread out 
and touched each person there. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to talk in other languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. Wow. Soon the disciples were going out to spread the gospel to anyone who would listen and they were not afraid even to die. Coming from 1 Corinthians fifteen thirty to 31 And as for us, why would we run the risk of danger every hour? My brothers and sisters, I face death every day. The pride I have in you, in our life, in union with Christ Jesus our Lord, makes me declare this. Wow. That's quite a testimony, huh? That's Paul. Yeah. Well, and we know many examples of Christians who, Christian martyrs who've received treatment that they did not deserve. There's a very famous uh, story about uh, one of the guy who was the original, probably the original bishop of the Christian church in Smyrna. And he, they, they tried to track him and they tried to get him for quite a long time. They finally caught him on a Sabbath afternoon. And he said, when they thought him, he said, there was a Christian family nearby. He said, come on into the house here. And while they were, the, he asked the lady there, please prepare something good for these soldiers to eat. And he stood in the corner, and this is all documented, he stood in the corner of the, of the room and prayed for every Christian he knew in the whole area while they were preparing to take him out to be, to be martyred. Was that Polycarp? Yeah. 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 Quite a guy. Yeah, just an amazing story. Sometimes, however, it does seem like the wicked are successful and the righteous are punished or unrewarded. And what will be the final, final answer to all of that? Ecclesiastes twelve thirteen to 14. After all this, there is only one thing to say. Have reverence for God and obey His commands, because this is all that human beings were created for. God is going to judge everything we do whether good or bad, even things done in secret. I can remember uh, having a discussion with, about this with my friend and mentor, Dr. Graham Maxwell, and he said, I wish Solomon had come up with a better conclusion to his book than that. Sure. There's so much more than just look out for the judgment. Yeah. But uh, maybe that's the best Solomon could do after the life he lived. And the, I mean, he did. he started out so well. Just well, he was mentally ill. Let's yeah. face it; that, that's He's a whole. Good, jaded by this time. Yeah. Ecclesiastes is a story of a mentally ill person. Mm-hmm. Well, Bible-believing Christians base their faith on their understanding of God and His character, their understanding of the nature of life and death, and the world in which we live. So, we've got a lot of evidence stacked up there that we 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 base our faith on. It certainly was not God's plan for our world to go through all of this. But God's judgment will get it all straight and correct in the end. And I was very happy this week as I was running. I was listening to some material from Ellen White. And she says in one place that it was God's plan originally that the, the Garden of Eden would, gra- would gradually expand until the whole, wor- the whole world would be like the Garden of Eden. Mm. I, don't, I don't know whether that's going to be the way it's going to be. That? Huh? That? that was in um, the SDA Bible Commentary, um, Volume 7A is what I'm listen- looking at right now, listening to. So um, something she wrote maybe for Signs of the Times or something? Probably, yeah. Somewhere else? Yeah. Well, if you read, if you read uh, uh, Genesis uh, 1, verse 2, the earth became a chaos. Yeah. If you read uh, Isaiah 45, 18, this earth was created to be inhabited, not a chaos. Yeah. So now you have a place to put the war in heaven. Yeah. It's it's a beautiful thing. And the Garden of Eden was the, the, the start. I mean, it, it makes a lot of good sense what you just said there. Yeah. Well, um, I'm going to take time. I think we've got a, little, a few couple of extra minutes. I'm going to read Revelation 21, 1 to 5, and then 22, <clears throat> 1 to 5. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth disappeared and the sea vanished. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared and ready like a bride dressed to meet her husband. I heard a loud voice speaking from the throne, 
Now God's home is with human beings. He will live with them and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and he will be their God. He will wipe away all tears from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more grief or crying or pain. The old things have disappeared. The, then the one who sits on the throne said, And now I make all things new. He also said to me, Write this, because these words are true and can be trusted. And if you drop down to the next chapter, The angel also showed me the river of the water of life, sparkling like crystal and coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb, and flowing down the middle of the city street. On each side of the river was the tree of life, which bears fruit twelve times a year, once each month, and its leaves are for the healing of the nations. Whenever I read that passage, I remember my brief time visiting in in uh, Jamaica. My parents worked there for a year, the hospital there. And the Jamaicans at that point in time were absolutely certain that the tree of life is a mango tree with 12 different kinds of mangoes. <laughs> 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 Nothing that is under God's curse will be found in the city. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city and His servants will worship Him. They will see His face and His name will be written on their foreheads. There shall be no more night and they will need not need lamps or sunlight because the Lord God will be their light and they will rule as kings forever and ever. So it is beyond our power to imagine that, that world. And, and, and Paul tells us that. Margaret? In First uh, Corinthians 2, verse 9, However, as the scripture says, what no one ever saw or heard, what no one ever thought could happen, is the very thing God prepared for those who love him. It might be very hard for us to imagine in this troubled, scarred, tragic world in which we live what it will be like to be in heaven. Ellen White assured us that we will spend the rest of eternity explaining to the rest of the universe what salvation has meant to us. Peter, in fact, said basically that. He said, we're going to be priests and, and kings. So we're going to be storytellers for the rest Story of eternity? Storytellers, yeah. Mm-hmm. True Same story. In, in Numbers, mm-hmm. isn't it? Clear yes, well, no, in, in uh, Exodus. Exodus 19. Exodus 19. Yeah. 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 But meanwhile, still down here on planet Earth, we need to be doing everything we can, through every means we can, to reach out to those who are still hurting and need to hear the gospel. We know that things will only get worse as, approach, as we approach the second coming. Jim? When the voice of God turns the captivity of his people, there is a terrible awakening of those who have lost all in the great conflict of life. While probation continues, they were blinded by Satan's deceptions, and they justified their course of sin. The rich prided themselves upon their superiority to those who were less favored, but they had obtained their riches by violation of the law of God. They had neglected to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to deal justly, and to love mercy. They have sold their souls for earthly riches and enjoyments and have not sought to become rich toward God. The result is their lives are a failure, their pleasures are now turned to gall, their treasures to corruption. Great Controversy 654. Carrie, I think you have something to add to that. Yes. The Great Controversy is ended. Sin and sinners are no more. The entire universe is clean. One pulse of harmony and gladness beats through the vast creation. From him who created all flow life and light and gladness throughout the realms of illimitable space. From the minutest atom to the greatest world, all things, animate and inanimate, in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy, Declare that God is love. Wow. Great controversy, page 678. And those who are familiar with that series of five volumes that Ellen White wrote recognize that as the final conclusion at the very end of the great controversy. Imagine the time if the entire universe is rejoicing that God is love. And of course, that means what? We all will be rejoicing in love and exercising love toward each other. We have been assured that God will not allow evil to continue forever. So how are we spending the time we have left here on planet Earth? What motivates us to reach out to the poor and needy, 
and to share the gospel. Only the love of God. Yeah. Jesus was the greatest teacher ever lived on this earth. Why is it that he could not get his disciples to understand or even get the message to John the Baptist of the truth about his kingdom here on this earth? I mean, <coughs> how long was he with his disciples? Some of them for three and a half years. Mm-hmm. Others for only two years. But, I mean, you know, he's God on earth. Why, why can't he explain this to people that later... You know, Ellen White says in, in Desire of Ages that these would be some of the greatest people who ever lived. And, and Jesus picked them out, even though they seem like nobodies, and turned the world upside down with these guys. God is love, and you can't force people to think. Well, there are layers of thinking, and there are things that are more important than others. Yeah. Uh, like and, making Jesus king, right? Right. So <laughs> ha- setting their heart on, on earthly things prevented them to from seeing the spiritual things. And at the end, he said, I have many things to tell you, but you cannot bear them now. Yeah. So there's a whole process that has to go on. I think in a way, maybe the same thing is happening with us. Really? Hmm. How could that be? You know, when you think of college and university courses, you know, they're maybe a quarter long, maybe two or three quarters. And, you know, part of a day or part of three days a week maybe or four days a week for an hour and even if it's a great if it's a great teacher I've got it down yeah how come Jesus as a great teacher didn't get it down with that well 16 hours a day for three years yeah amazing were they that warped in their preconceptions apparently so I mean, there's no. I mean, there's plenty of evidence that it's a lot harder to get people to unlearn something that they already think they know than it is to to teach them something new. Which is why he chose the unlearned rather than the learned. Although exactly. there were some like Paul who he had to turn, and Nicodemus and mm-hmm. Joseph of Arimathea, they responded, and probably other priests and and uh, mm-hmm. and scribes well, also. But, uh, Acts, but it took longer. Yeah. Acts 6, verse 7, and Acts 15, verse 5, it's clearly that uh, scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees, a fair number of them actually became followers of Jesus, finally, when it was all done and said. Well, if you read the, the message that John gave to the original crowds there in Matthew 3, 1 to 12, he's saying, Messiah's going to come and he's going to... Repent. Yeah, repent. 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 Yeah, because things are happening and, and, and Jesus is going to come and he's going to conquer the world and so forth. And then, what happened? Jesus ends, John ends up in prison and Jesus is up there. And when, when John went to prison, what did Jesus do? Went to left Galilee. Galilee. Yeah. He left Judea and went to Galilee. And John started thinking, hold on now. I, I thought we were coming to the end of this. Uh, we're, we're gonna we're gonna rule the world, and here I am in prison. And of course, he, you know, got his head cut off. But he he sent that message to Jesus, and Jesus sent his disciples his disciples back to him and said, "What was he supposed to tell them? What were they supposed to tell him? I'm sorry. What they had seen. What they had they seen. Were supposed to report back. Yeah. What Jesus had done. Okay. Where do we go next? I hope he died in peace when the time yeah. came. Yeah, because well, he seems to clearly misunderstand yeah. what Jesus is here for. <clears throat> okay, who has the next one there? You do. You do. Yeah, you like do. the Savior's disciples, John the Baptist did not understand the nature of Christ's kingdom. He expected Jesus to take the throne of David, and as time passed and the Savior made no claim to kingly authority, John became perplexed and troubled. Like the prophet Elijah, in whose spirit and power he had come to Israel, he looked for the Lord to reveal himself as a God that answereth by fire. And now from his dungeon, he, John, watched for the lion of the tribe of Judah to cast down the pride of the oppressor and to deliver the poor and him that cried. But Jesus seemed to content himself with gathering disciples about him and healing and teaching the people. He was eating at the tables of the publicans and while every day the Roman yoke rested more heavily upon Israel. I mean, think of the irony of that. You're expecting Jesus to conquer the enemies and he's eating with them. You know? 
While King Herod and his vile paramour worked their will, and the cries of the poor and the suffering went up to heaven. Desire of Ages 2.15, verses paragraph, paragraph 2 and 3. Well, we know that there are many examples in the New Testament of Christ reaching out to people who are hurting, touching their lives, making them better. Um, an obvious example was a time when Jesus landed on the shore of Lake Galilee and there was a the head of the synagogue said, Come quick, my daughter's dying. And Jesus raced over there, uh, or he tried to, and there were crowds of crowding around him. And what happened in the middle of that excursion to his to, to help the, his daughter? Woman with the issue of blood yeah. touched his garment in hopes that... Instantly healed. Yes. You know, you... You know that God could do that all the time. He could give someone power to do that today if he chose. Um, why doesn't he? She oh, just touched his clothes and bang, she was well. Well, it would get you a lot of attention. Yeah. Maybe we couldn't handle it, huh? Well, finally, he went there all the way to the man's house. And what did he do? He raised his that, the man's daughter from dead. And I, uh, while Jesus was saying this, that, you know, Jesus said to her, My daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your trouble. While Jesus was saying this, some messengers came from Jairus' home, a house, and told him, your daughter has died. Why bother the teacher any longer? And I don't know if we've stopped to think about this, but the people from the synagogue, the, the leaders in the synagogue, weren't the best friends of Jesus. And here's a man who had to humble himself and cast himself at the feet of Jesus, and now suddenly it looks like his hope is gone. Jesus paid no attention to what they said, but told him, "Don't be afraid; only believe." Then he did not eat. Then he did not let anyone else go on with him except Peter and James and his brother John. They arrived at Jairus' house, where Jesus saw the confusion, and heard all the loud crying and wailing. He went in and said to them, "Why all this confusion? Why are you crying? The child is not dead; she's only sleeping." They laughed at him, so he put them all out, took the child's father and mother and his three disciples and went into the room where the child was lying. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, you know what that means? That's Aramaic, which means, little girl, I tell you to get up. She got up at once and started walking around. She was 12 years old. When this happened, they were completely amazed, but Jesus gave them strict orders not to tell anyone, and he said, give her something to eat. And I just, you know... The, the, the girl is 12 years old. She just resurrected from the dead. Is she going to spend the rest of her time, rest of her life hiding in the house? I mean, you know, there's no way you can hide that kind of information. Why did Jesus even bother to tell them not to tell anyone? Why did he tell them not to tell anyone? Yeah. This so. time had not yet come. Yeah. So, bring too much attention to Jesus? Yeah, well, and Ellen White just says in Desire of Ages, his... He became so well known for his healing and so forth in, Gal in, in Galilee, but especially in Capernaum, he couldn't go into a building. He had, to, he had to stay out in the countryside all day long because the crowds who were following him, there was no place for them to go. Wow. Well, and then there's this story of Zacchaeus in Jericho. Dennis, I think... This is from the Great Controversy 492, paragraph 2 to 493. It is impossible to explain the origin of sin so as to give a reason for its existence. Yet enough, enough may be understood concerning both the origin and the final di disposition of sin to make fully manifest the justice and benevolence of God in all his dealings with evil. Nothing is more plainly taught in Scripture than that God was in no wise responsible for the entrance of sin, that there was no arbitrary withdrawal of divine grace, no deficiency in the divine government that gave occasion for the uprising of rebellion. Sin is an intruder for those for whose presence no reason can be given. It is mysterious, unaccountable. To excuse it is to defend it. Could excuse be found or cause be shown for its existence, it would cease to be sin. 
Our only definition of sin is that given in the word of God. It is the transgression of the law. It is the outworking of the principle at war with the great law of love, which is the foundation of the divine government. Wow. Well, the great controversy is waging on. It is impossible for us to understand Satan's motives and actions, but we have the good news that God understands all and will bring the whole thing to a conclusion one day. We must place ourselves on God's side and not on Satan's side. First John 3, 8. Whosoever continues to sin belongs to the devil because the devil has sinned from the very beginning. The Son of God appeared for this very reason, to destroy what the devil had done. In this lesson, we have suggested that Adventists need to be careful. And we're running out of time, but Gordon, you want to... To avoid two extremes. One, overexcitement about our expectancy of Christ's second coming that writes off the present world as doomed and therefore militates against our putting forth any effort into working for the good of the society in which we live. And two, indifference to Christ's advent that makes the present world the main focus for which to live and work. For these indifferent ones, the present world is not a waiting room to the coming world, but a living room to occupy comfortably in a relaxed manner from the Teacher's Bible Study Guide. So which of those rooms do you live in? Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for these challenges. They're thought-provoking. They're raising some real questions about how we should live our lives. And may all those who have shared with us and thinking through this lesson be blessed and be challenged as well as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.